So today I want to cover a couple of interesting little topics and aspects of our game reserve that make it so unique and diverse. We're going to start looking at biomes. Good morning everyone, welcome back to another beautiful day on Shumari Private Game Reserve. So today I want to cover a couple of interesting little topics and aspects of our game reserve that make it so unique and diverse. We're going to start looking at biomes. We're going to look at the characteristics of an area that will distinguish it from another area. And we're very fortunate at Shumari because the diversity here is just off the charts. So in South Africa it's generally accepted that there are nine different biomes. And a biome is an area that has its own unique climate, its own vegetation, its own geology, and its own animal species that make it quite unique and identifiable to a different area. Think about a desert or a rainforest, completely different. And that's what a biome is. So in South Africa, we have savanna biome, grassland. We have Nama Karoo, Albany Thicket biome, Indian Ocean Coastal Belt, Succulent Karoo, Fainbos, we have desert, and forest biome. Shimwari is quite a unique place. If you look at South Africa as a map and split the country in half and go all the way down to the coast, that's pretty much where we are. In South Africa, there's a 500 millimeter ISO Hyatt, and it's a line that receives about 500 millimeters of rain per annum. Everything on the line and heading to the west of the country towards Cape Town is more winter rainfall and generally drier and more arid. Everything on the line and heading east towards Natal is 500 millimeters of rain or more and a summer rainfall. We're fortunate at Shimwari because we get both a summer and a winter rainfall, but because of where we are situated, there's this convergence of all of the biomes or nearly all of the biomes in South Africa in this one spot. And that's why in such a short distance, we can traverse from one biome into the next and just have the most amazing diversity. So on Shimwari, we have representation from about five of the biomes. Some of them in greater degrees and, and representation than in others, but we're very lucky that we have the Albany thicket, savanna biome, grassland. We have forest and we have fainbos, and it's in varying degrees of, of indicator species and, and sometimes it's just a little, little dab of it coming in. In some instances, it's much greater varieties of it. And depending on where you are on the reserve, you'll see these different types of plants and animals showing themselves in prevalence. The first area that we're going to go into this morning is what we would consider a forest biome. And I said earlier that each area has its unique species that are indicator species to a specific biome. For example, you're not going to find a bat-eared fox in the forest. It's not adapted to a forest environment. But you are going to find a bushbuck. And a bushbuck is an indicator species of the forest environment. And as we're walking down this pathway into this forest area, the first thing we've come across is bushbuck tracks and indicate the species that we're moving into a forest biome. I'm listening, I can hear Neisner tarakos, I can hear dark back weavers, all bird species that indicate a forest biome. Let's go and have a look. So in South Africa, the forest biome is really, really tiny. If we look at a total land mass of South Africa, the forest areas only cover 0.25% of our total land mass. That's really, really tiny. On the east coast of South Africa, as you're moving from the high felt to the low felt, there's an escarpment. And on the side of that escarpment, there's a lot of patches of forest, and that travels all the way along down the east coast of South Africa, all the way along to the Neisner area. You can get a summer or a winter rainfall. If it's a winter rainfall, generally more than 500 millimeters of rain per annum. If it's a summer rainfall, more than about 700 millimeters of rain per annum. And you can see where we are. It's, it's humid, it's moist, we're in a drought. If you go out of this environment for 
three, four kilometers will be unrecognizable. There's nothing uh, as lush or green as this. So we're in a humid environment here. The trees are huge. Uh, yellowwoods, we're gonna walk a little bit further up and just see these massive, massive yellowwood trees indicate a species of a forest biome. Typical of forests is you have a canopy above you. The, the leaves of all the trees form a canopy. You have a mid layer and things like these creepers and lianas climbing up. And when you get down to a base lower level, there's, there's very little because the canopy can be so thick that light doesn't penetrate through and the things that grow on the floor are really battling and struggling to get hold of light. So it really is a competition. Bird species like crowned eagles, marina trogons, Neisner turacos, all indicate a species of a forest biome. We find them in these areas. We've got beautiful canopy structure for birds to move through. On one of our last episodes, we were looking at a bird party moving through and how they absolutely utilize this canopy section for feeding different species utilizing different levels of the forest. Species of mammals that we would see quite commonly in these areas would be things like vervet monkeys, bush buck, bush pigs, animals that are suited to a thick, dense, vegetated environment. So one of the things that aren't supposed to happen within a forest biome is fires. It's very, very seldom that this area will actually burn. It doesn't have the fuel load on the ground. It's always damp and the humidity is very high. So it's not supposed to burn. Whereas something like Feinbos, which is supposed to burn, it needs fire in order to regenerate itself, burns on a regular basis. This isn't supposed to burn. It, it would only be due to things like extreme drought or invasive plant species coming in and increasing the fuel load that could cause these areas to burn. How amazing is this? How beautiful is this in this forest environment? So we've just moved a little bit along through into this area. Look at the size of this wild plum tree. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. And right next to it, look at the size of this yellowwood. These yellowwood trees can grow up to about 35 meters tall and have a trunk radius of over three meters. It's massive. Uh, and yellowwood is an indicator species of the forest biome. The reason I came up over here is just an important thing about the forest environment is the trees form these little microbiomes in themselves. If you look down below me over here, in the bowl in this tree over here, there's another plant species growing in here. And up over there, growing in the fork of the tree over there, is another species of tree called the cabbage tree. And as animals are utilizing these fruits and berries from the trees in this environment and utilizing these trees as a, as a, a, a area of safety. They might be roosting in there, sleeping at nighttime. It could be baboons, monkeys, fruit eating birds, uh, frugivores, like uh, we've seen the Neisner turaca over there, crowned hornbills, that type of stuff. So they'll be depositing the seeds behind and indeed there is yellowwood seeds left behind in this nutrient rich medium over here and so that'll germinate and grow and form these uh, it's just the most amazing intricate and very very complex system So another great indicator species in the forest biome is things like ferns. They are able to survive down in these low-lying areas in dappled shade. There's a lot of moisture and high humidity and they really thrive in this environment. So everywhere you look around over here, there's water, there's moss, there's lichen, there's ferns. It's a really moist, humid environment. But if you were to drive a kilometer or two outside, it's actually quite arid. And you'll find within these very fragmented pockets of forest, the, the terrain just leads itself to a different climatic condition completely. The sides are generally quite steep and enclosed, so there's not as much evaporation. The sun can't get through down to here. The tall trees, 
prevent a lot of the sun's rays from hitting the ground and evaporating water. The geology of the area, you, you get a lot of springs in these environments. So any groundwater is forced to run out and come into these areas and start forming these little rivers and drainage lines and always within the forest biome. The next biome we want to cover is the Albany Thicket biome. Now this is by far the greatest surface area of Shamwari that is covered by Thicket biome. A Thicket biome is really complex because there's not only just one type of thicket, there's a number of different types. There's dune thicket, there's riverine thicket, there's valley bushveld thicket, uh, there's mesic thicket. There's a whole bunch of different subsections within the Thicket biome. And we're going to look at a little bit of those now. They're really complex and they're really varied. One of the important things about the thicket biome is the diversity. It's said that within South Africa, the thicket biome holds the widest diversity of plant species in the medium woody range category. So apart from Feinbos, the highest diversity is here behind me in this thicket biome. It's absolutely insane what you can find here. And just by looking at it, it is characteristically about three meters tall and it is impenetrable. It's thick, thick, thick vegetation. A lot of the plants have thorns and spines on them and it's really hardy, woody and evergreen. The thing to remember about a thicket biome is this is almost the transition zone. This is the mixing pot for all of our biomes. And, and what we see here can be really confusing at times because sometimes you think you're looking at almost like a forest environment, but it's not. Sometimes you think you're looking at more of a, a, a Nama Karoo environment, but you're not. So there's a lot of succulent plants, there's a lot of woody plants, there's a lot of short vegetation, taller vegetation, but it all mixes together. And this is where we get the blending in South Africa, particularly because of our summer and our winter rainfall. So if we look at a few important indicator species for the Albany thicket, things like kudu, things like elephant, even vervet monkey would be important. But let's look at a couple of the smaller things. We've got the unique Addo flightless dung beetle. That's endemic to this area, found nowhere else on earth. And we've got another important one, the Albany adder. That was only recently discovered in this Albany district. So when looking at this type of environment, you can see why elephants would be perfectly adapted to this uh, environment or bush type. There's a few important plant species here that are really, really important. Things like speckworm, Portulacaria afro. This is a major food source for elephants and kudus. Black rhino as well. The elephants basically tunnel through, they push through on these game trails and open up the environment. And that allows things like black rhino, kudus and other animals to follow through. There's a lot of spike thorn here. There's a lot of plumbago. A lot of interesting plants, but quite diverse and varied. And then we can even move across to things like the euphorbias, another hugely interesting plant family. We get the really tall ones like the euphorbia triangularis, the river euphorbia, and the euphorbia tetragona, the honey euphorbia, all the way down to small, almost ground level euphorbias. Things like the euphorbia enormous or a fungerpol, all unique indicator species of Albany thicket. So as we've moved off of the ridges down to this lower lying area, we're still dealing with the thicket biome. But it's opened up a lot more, there's a lot more interspersed grassy areas and we're moving towards uh, even some riverine habitat over there. We've got a large euphorbia on the side over here and looking up onto the side of the hills you can just see that dense, dense bush. And the geology is so vastly different from one area to the next that uh, just the diversity in there is absolutely marvellous. Part of the camera crew was asking about scientific names earlier and why we use them. We were talking about Sincarpha recurvata, and Euphorbia tetragonia, and uh, all of these different names. And it's, it's, it's for continuity of information, basically, and for an understanding universally. For an example, we get blue bush here. We get two different types of blue bush. If I said to someone, you need to go and eat a blue bush because it's really good for you, and they went and ate the wrong one, they could get sick and die. But if you tell someone there's a Teronia in Ghana and there's a Diospyrus lycoides, they're going to know the difference between the blue bush. So common names are 
they, they're so varied within an area. I know a certain plant is one thing, but someone else from another area calls it something else as a common name. But the scientific name is universal, it stays the same. And that's one of the important reasons why we use it. In this area, there is such diversity. Very often, you can't find common names. If you get down to a genus or a species, you're lucky. So that's often why we use scientific names. Well, I hope you enjoyed that this morning, looking at a few of the biome areas that are covered over Shimori Private Game Reserve. We looked at forest and we looked at Albany Thicket. Join us on the next episode where we'll look at a few of the other biomes that comprise of Shimwari and make us unique. Give us a like, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We'll see you soon.